I want to talk a little bit about finishing and just a little bit about maybe some design parameters and things that will help you get a better product before we go into the coloring. So talking about design parameters, I think one of the big mistakes people make is that they set their margin offset too small. Like I've seen it as low as 0 0.1, 0 0.08. Uh, we used to use 0 0.12, and what we would notice is that we'd get, you know, started to get chipping on edges, and we we attributed that to the tools, so we changed our tools. And then it occurred to me, since I'm finishing margins anyway in the green state, why risk it? So we have gone to a 0 0.2 offset on margins, which thickens them up a little bit. It really reduces chipping to nothing and, and, and gives a perceived lifetime of our tools almost double, right? And, and so since I'm going to thin them down to the green state anyway, it really doesn't cause extra time to do that, yet it gives you a more consistent, better product with, like I said, less chipping and longer tool life. So that being said, we also sprue our units uh, with only two sprues, one buckle, one lingual. Uh, there's only bridges in here, but I have singles that I just took out of this puck. And we'll typically ask the mill to remove the sprues on the facial or buckle surfaces, okay? Uh, that's not how this was done. These were only partially removed. But there's no harm, and it's a matter of fact, I think it's better to go ahead and have the mill remove the sprues on the facial. You can leave them partially cut on the lingual, and that way, and here's an example of a, of a molar where it was done that way. You can see that the facial is almost perfectly removed, very little finishing to do, no sprue to grind, and yet our lingual sprue is just left with a little nub that we're going to have to finish off. And then green finish this uh, for our margins and to enhance our occlusal morphology. Now these are the, uh, the finishing instruments that I like to use, mainly the Wagner um, Green State Finishing Kit, but these carbides here are ones that I found through a company called uh, Cardinal, and I really like them for specific things. Um, the long skinny one I use for removing uh, units from the puck because it can reach down in and not do damage to the actual unit. The bigger carbide here I like for uh, grinding off the sprues because it's very smooth and fast. And then this little tiny pointy thing, and you'll see it in action, I use to enhance occlusal morphology on posteriors to deepen the pits and fissures and make them look a little more natural. Because even though we can mill with a .3 tool, it really doesn't give us the kind of sharpness that I like. But that's a personal thing. And so this thing will, and I use a, you know probably half speed on my, on, my, um, on my tool, and also just make sure that you have something supple and soft beneath you. You know, I use this nylon screen uh, to basically catch my units as they drop, because they will drop, but I want suction too coming through because this dust is really pretty dangerous. So, you know, these this this tool will go right through here really easy. Uh, much and because it's so long we have access without having to turn it over necessarily and without having to um, touch and maybe mess up our existing units. And then it's gonna drop, boom, there it goes. So again, and with a 0.2 offset, your chance of chipping a margin is pretty much zero. So really, I just wanted to show this, this tool because it really is nice, it's really fast, it's really smooth, it never grabs and runs and hits your unit. And like I said, I can reach way through and remove a sprue that uh, without hitting a unit, without having to flip it over and go from side to side to cut them out. Just saves a little time, that's it. Okay, so step two is really just removal of sprues. Again, like I said, I like this tool uh, from Cardinal. I just really prefer this. Don't run it quite as fast as when I'm um, removing the actual sprues out of the puck, but it's just incredibly smooth and fast. And the whole point when you're finishing green stay zirconia is of course to get rid of what you don't want in terms of a sprue, but to keep the surface facet free, or I should say facet free, we, we, we decided that term should be facet, right? And uh, smooth and remove the tool marks. <clears throat> and again, we've <clears throat> excuse me gotten to where we don't mill anymore in high quality mode. Um, it's a little better, but since I'm gonna go over the surface anyway with um, with my green state finishing tools from Wagner, uh, I find that uh, it just really is not worth the extra time to mill in high quality. It doesn't save me anything really when I'm finishing, and so we've really kind of abandoned that and gone back to, to milling in standard mode, which is much faster, and then uh, achieving the smooth surface we want in the green state finishing, since we're going to be doing this anyway. 
so uh, you know, I this I, I do you know rather quickly. I'm really not too concerned. I just don't want to gouge the surface. So that's that. Okay, that's all those units. Then uh, we're going to thin our margins and then look at our surface texture and get that and our surface uh, smoothness and get that done in the green state. So I'm done with my carbide. And I will start with the molar because they're probably the most involved. And again, when it comes to these Wagner tools, um, they, they have two basic types or three basic types. They have um, this gray material, which is more abrasive, and the pure gray are only the smaller. And these, I think, are a little bit aggressive. They don't really leave a shiny, smooth surface, but they're good in some areas, especially because of the point. They have this white, it's almost like a silicone material that is, I guess, the fine material, quite smooth. I like this a lot on facials. And then the combination of the gray and the white, which is obvious, it's for a little more aggressive uh, removal of, of zirconia on the side with a nice, fine, smooth tip for refining the surfaces and smoothing them up. Um, your choice, what you like. I, I you know, I kind of oscillate back and forth doing margins, although these are kind of nice because they're a little quicker. Depends on what makes you comfortable, okay, when you're doing things. But I'll start with this one for the margins. And of course, you want to use loops. And uh, so I'm going to switch to my loops. So we're going to start with the margins and just thinning those down. And I always do it like this, kind of like you, you would sharpen a knife blade. I look at the thickness of the margin edge and just come along and just take it down until I can't see the edge anymore, until it just disappears. And so, you know, you definitely don't want to remove a margin. That's really uh, that's not what you want to do. So a little caution, it definitely loops or under a microscope for this, but it's really not a very tricky process and it goes very fast to thin these down. And just because, uh, again, we do not want to touch zirconia at, in the post-centered state. It's too susceptible to damage um, and it takes too long to thin margins down. Um, and I think, but mainly though, the heating of the zirconia, especially if you spark it, the grinding of it, when you do that, like I said, all bets are off in terms of what kind of strength is left of your zirconia. And that's it on the margins. And then really, I should have some nice facial anatomy existing, some little lobe uh, development, things like that, on the, on the buccal cusps, in the, in, in the developmental groove, maybe in the furca if I've got one. That really, I just want to enhance the smooth. I really, I really should not be carving anatomy in. That should be done in the design. It should be done in the mill. And so I'm really just removing uh, tool marks, like I said, and trying to get rid of facets uh, that are on the surface because they just absolutely do not look natural. And, and it's not an easy thing to do. You've got to keep moving, and you've got to be a little bit persistent sometimes to do that right. But uh, it's really, these tools make it super easy to accomplish a good smooth uh, surface. And even a little shiny, because I, like I said, I don't want to, if I can not touch this after I've centered it, I'm really happy. I don't like to do anything. I don't even like to stain or necessarily even glaze, because if I do this right, I can actually just hand polish quickly my zirconia. But again, that's a personal thing, and it's up to the individual what they really like to do. As far as the occlusal goes, uh, I'll stop on the outer surfaces, right, with my smoothing, and then I'm going to go right to enhancing my morphology on the occlusal with that small carbide, and then I'll come in and smooth some of the secondary grooves and those things. And again, only focusing on primary and de developmental grooves when I'm doing uh, the occlusal morphology. So, uh, really, like I said, when it comes to enhancing the occlusal morphology, I'm really interested in the pits and fissures in the primary uh, anatomy developmental grooves. And I, and I want to approach a pit with basically three, the marginal ridge pits and the central fossa pit. And I always put my point, and I'm going to disappear a little bit as I blow these off, but I'll start with my point in there and just follow the groove a little bit. And this is, this is really a very uh, kind of minor. It's not a lot to do. It's just this little bit of crispness that you can add in these grooves really does, after, post center, give us a much more natural look. And as you know, when you have a little pit, it collects stain and makes a natural, realistic looking uh, brown or ochre stained pit. Um, I will, like I said, do my developmental grooves, and, and I like this instrument because it's super pointy, but it has it gets thicker as we go, so it contours the edges 
of the, um, the sides of the grooves sort of naturally and nicely without having to go back and, and do anything besides sort of follow the, the pattern. So that's really all I really want to do. I mean, I got three nice pits developed here now. They're going to stain really well if that's what I want to do. Uh, done. So that's what I use this little tool for. Now the Wagner tool does have diamonds, but I prefer this carbide. Okay, so uh, the Wagner kit also includes an array of diamonds. Uh, some quite pointy, quite nice. None as nice as that carbide, but they have a couple that are a little bigger. The end is sort of like an obelisk, like a, like a, a chamfer uh, burr that a dentist might use. And I like that just for smoothing into my secondary anatomy, just a little bit. And I don't really feel the need to run the, uh, the little carbide into these because typically they're not really sharp grooves. They're more like contour changes. At least I think that works out pretty nice. And really, if they, there's not much to do here, even this step isn't really all that necessary in every case, but I do it because I'm kind of that way. And really, I just want to make sure that I enhance my little subtle secondary anatomy areas. And then I'll go right to then smoothing off the tool marks off the occlusal. Just a quick step, and you can take it to whatever extent you feel you want to. You can even run your small groove tool up in there if you like more enhanced secondary anatomy. Um, I'm one that really doesn't particularly uh, go for that. And then, you know, my, the final tool I use is really back to the Wagner uh, silicone uh, rubber wheels or rubber cylinders that we have, really just to hit my inclines and the areas where I've gone in to enhance my anatomy just to remove the tool marks. And I do this lightly, particularly in areas that I know have got my occlusion. I don't want to take a lot off of this. I just want to get rid of these uh, striations created uh, by the mill. And back to how to mill, you know, standard or high quality, again, that's a personal thing. If you try standard on zirconia and you really feel like your tool marks are too deep and too much, then by all means, go back to high quality. And again, my goal here, and I'm looking on the facial, is to eliminate facets on the surface that is almost impossible to do. It's really difficult, mainly eliminating tool marks. Because remember also that when we center this, it's going to shrink by about 20% or a little more. And so all this is going to come together and create a really nice, fine, occlusal surface. And as the, as the uh, facets that we produce um, shrink also, they become uh, less in significance. And so what you see here, you can spend all day trying to get this perfectly smooth. That is not the point. Uh, and again, it becomes really less obvious after we're centered just because of the shrinkage and the fact the size goes down significantly. So that's about it. That's about all I really want to do right there. Perfect. And that is just um, enhance the clues a little bit. You know, I could spend all day messing with these little facets that are here and there. Let's which really, uh, you got to know when to stop, and that's perfect. Okay, so really, there's nothing different on finishing, let's say, a single central. We want to thin the margins, we want to smooth off tool marks, enhance our morphology, um, really make sure our lingual uh, fossa is nice, but, but no enhancement of any of the anatomy, because there, really, there isn't any. And so that's pretty much like a molar, not worth going over. Same with a bridge, really, you know, I will, I can, I can thin the margins around about three quarters of these on the outside, but here, interproximally, is a different problem. But we also want to address these embrasures and enhance them a little bit. Again, the way you make a bridge look real is to make it look like individual teeth, and the way you do that is by having nice embrasure development. So that's what I just love these little Wagner rubber discs for. Super thin, very pliable, and they're easy to, they cut really fast, so be careful. And so what we're going to do is, and, and again, you don't want to, no overkill here. This is just a very subtle little enhancement of the facial embrasure. And you want to kind of approach it and smooth from your axi from your uh, facial walls, your interproximal walls, into the little groove. And you don't need to go real deep. Be really careful with this because the more we go, 
We're actually making a cleavage point, okay, which you don't want. And that's why I don't like anything thinner than this. Because this still leaves a slightly rounded bottom to the groove. And, and up here, where our incisal edges meet, these incisal embrasures, we definitely want those sharp. And so, um, you know, let the contour kind of guide you and just get these embrasures enhanced just enough so we start to look a little bit like separate teeth. And again, um, I don't really go underneath. I don't want, you know, I want to keep this for strength down here. So, and while this doesn't look real sharp right now, it's plenty, and once it shrinks, it will be a really nice looking embrasure once we center this and get the, get the shrinkage. And so while I'm doing this, I've saved my interproximal margins so that I can come in for like with this on the side and just thin them with a little of the edge of this disc right there and just thin these margins right down to a knife edge and look them over again. Again, I don't do underneath and I don't do the lingle at all. And in fact, these embrasures might be a little, real, for a real case, a little, a little um, too deep. Again, all our strength comes on the lingual because we want to enhance the facial a little bit. So, and again, the volume of your connectors, you know, is something that you need to consider when you do this for adequate strength. Um, and people have the different ideas about that. So, you know, I'm on an interior bridge, I'm good with staying at probably about uh, maybe eight millimeters squared, maybe something like that, four by two. And this is probably a little more, again, it's hard to judge sometimes on these because they're expanded. But when I look at the software and judge my connectors, I'm going for about eight square millimeters, eight to 10 on anteriors. And depending on the bridge, maybe a little more on posteriors, I think is adequate. So if we need more bulk of connectors, I'll do it on the lingual and sacrifice my lingual embrasures. Now again, these are probably a little bit more robust than we might have in a real case. But again, they're big teeth, so it would probably be okay. And that's it.